All right, and I said we was going to get right into prophecy, but we had a few questions, uh, a couple questions from last week that I want to address first because I believe I said I would um, do that. One of the questions um, was uh, when God gives a word for someone that he speaks through you uh, for a certain individual with instructions. If they don't follow the instructions, um, but expect it for his word to come to pass when it doesn't come to pass, are you a false prophet or is it your fault? Um, and so again, I'm going to give some scriptures that y'all can turn to later and will be in the notes. Um, but one is Ezekiel chapter 33. And uh, when God says, if he says to the wicked, you shall surely die. The Bible said, if he turns from his wickedness, that he shall live. And he says, if I say to the righteous, he shall live. And he turns from his righteousness. The Bible said, he shall surely die. And so it was not uncommon for there to be an if factor in prophecy. Um, when Elisha prophesied to uh, Jehoash um, about defeating the Syrian army, I believe that's in 2 Kings chapter 13. I'm pretty sure it's there. 2 Kings 13. Um, and the Bible said the king smote the ground three times with the arrow. Uh, Elisha said, if you just smoked the ground five times, he said, then the Lord would have destroyed uh, the Syrians altogether. But because he only did it thrice, he only got a degree of what God said was going to happen because God has said that they were going to uh, defeat the Syrians until they had totally consumed them. But now only hundreds of thousands died because he did not follow up the word of God right. He didn't give it his all, and there was an if factor in that prophecy. There's another thing that uh, word that comes to mind. I talk about a little bit, I think, um, maybe in the Born of Water book. But um, I know when I go and teach, I usually like to talk about will and shall in the Bible. And it's a difference when the word of God comes and says, I will do this, versus the word of God coming and saying what shall happen. Because shall is synonymous with what should happen. Um, ye shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And then if somebody doesn't recover, sometimes folks will question um, what happened with me when that person I prayed for died? Uh, he put a shell factor with that. Um, and then I'll look at two more things real quick in that question. And one is Mark 8, 24, when Jesus prayed for the blind man and he came back and he told Jesus, I see men as trees. Well, that's not good. Uh, Jesus just prayed for him, and if anybody with one touch, uh, he should have got his healing, was being touched by Jesus. But when he uh, comes back and seeing men as trees, the Bible speaks how Jesus again anointed his eyes again. He did it a second time. Um, in that case, uh, now I know I'm talking about healing there, but in that case, the fault was not with Jesus. Um, yeah. There had to be an issue relative to faith. And that's the other thing that Romans chapter 12, uh, if you look at verse three and verse six, it speaks to us of, even when you prophesy, he said prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Some folks need to keep their mouth shut because uh, they prophesy even above their faith level. Okay, and so sometimes what they need to do is first work on their faith and also sometimes the individual they're dealing with. But there are other times when uh, what is going to happen does has nothing to do with that person's reaction to it. Um, if there's an if factor involved, 
then that should be uh, indicated in the shell factor in what God's already spoken, okay? Um, but there are other times when it's clear that this was not a prophecy from God. For example, um, and I want to be careful, uh, I'm going to be careful. And Tara, I want you always to be careful and to hear that we don't call people's name and, uh, because God can uh, correct them. And sometimes, unfortunately, even in things pertaining to God, we learn through experience sometimes. Um, but, but um, you know, I've seen where uh, people have said, the Lord said, by this time next year, you will have a child. And then um, you will have birthed a child. And, um, and then it didn't come to pass. I've seen where God did that with one who had been married about 10 years. And then God brought it to pass, just like he said. But I've seen where others prophesied. And actually the one person got two prophecies at the same meeting about the same thing. That this time next year you will have birthed a child and it didn't happen. Uh, so I know that that was not from God. Terry, talk to me for just a moment. I'm going to mute my mic. Um, talk to the audience for about 15, 20 seconds. Help us. Yeah, this is this type of lesson is really important because as we talk about the gifts of the spirit, um, and and as Pastor was just talking about the going forth, and then you're thinking that you're on point, and it doesn't happen, is really uh, key because the devil can try to play on that, start losing confidence, start feeling like oh well I'm off, so now I'm nervous, I don't want to go forth because I'm a mess up. The key is to getting the understanding. And it looks like that's what we'll get tonight. So I'm looking forward to the lesson. Yeah, yeah. And I'm looking forward to the lesson. I'm going to answer a couple more questions. Uh, first, so uh, prayerfully, we got another week, next week and the week after. Um, the second question, uh, how do you balance the words of Paul asking for resources to continue his missions versus people just focusing on money in their ministry? Tell I'm asking you to turn to 1 Timothy 5, 18. Now, what they're referring to is kind of what Letitia was speaking of, that nowadays, uh, I, I was hitting the fact that nowadays when people prophesy, it seems I always prophesy about stuff. Go get a new house, get a new car, make more money. It seems like the focus is on stuff. And so there's a lot I plan to say tonight relative to this question and, uh, and relative to prophecy. But 1 Timothy 5, 18, do you have it up there, my brother? For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out of the corn, and the labor is worthy of his reward. His reward. Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So this was a scripture that someone was referring to. Um, not muzzled ox that treadeth out the corn, labor is worthy of his reward. Um, and so they were asking if that, basically I believe they're asking if that refers to an, a minister receiving uh, money, uh, offerings or, or, um, or, or salaries or things of that nature. And one of the things that's tied about 1 Timothy chapter number 5, um, it's a familiar passage to a lot of us that have uh, been through my marriage counseling. For example, in verse 8, he speaks that if any provide not for his own, especially those of his own house, he is denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. And um, so what he spends the first part of this chapter doing, he talks about if you have a widow, that's a widow indeed. How it is the obligation of her children or her nephews to take care of her. If they don't have children or nephews, and, uh, and if she uh, took care of the children of God in the church, then it became the church's 
responsibility. Uh, verse 9 starts that, to take care of the widows in the church, those widows that took care of people. They were responsible for providing for the widow's needs. So you didn't have folks in your church out begging. But then he goes from dealing with the uh, widows and then he begins to deal with uh, the elders, okay? And, and uh, if you study this, this is not just preachers. He says in... Um, Verse 16, if any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. And so again, if she had sons and nephews, it's not the church's responsibility. That was dealing with the women who don't have a means of taking care of themselves. Verse 17, he begins to talk about the elder men. That's what he's referring to there as elders the elder men. And I could dive into that a whole bunch, but I want to make sure we get into our class and then come back to this. Um, he said, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Okay, that's first of all, because they would have a body of elders that overseeing the affairs of the church, much like uh, in the Old Testament, they had a body of elders that overseen the affairs of Israel, okay? Now, how do I know what I'm saying is true other than I got other scriptures and got pages? Um, how do I know other than that? Well, just in verse 17, Terry, read uh, the first part of verse 17. Yeah, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. So stop. And then after the comma, he says what? especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. And so some of them he's talking about here that are counted worthy of double honor are not even ones who labor in the word and doctrine. That's exactly right. Thank you. That doesn't have anything to do here with preachers. The, the first part of it, in giving an elder double honor, if they labor and if they labored in the church, taking care of the affairs of the church, then they should not, whether it's a man or a woman, be ever out on the streets because the house of God should be looking out for them. And verse 17, especially those who preach the gospel and teach the gospel. How could you have an older man, an elder, who preached the gospel and he's got to be in the cheese line. That's not right. Now, um, okay, I want to keep on down this street for a little while. Um, so one is talking about the older women who have no other means. The other one is talking about the older men. If I did a whole class and I think maybe that might be the next series we do on giving in the Bible's law of yeah. giving and stuff like that. Um, but even in the Old Testament, the Levites, Terry, I want you to um, read Numbers 18, verse 20, 23, and 24. This is a, an aside. Number 20 says, And the Lord spake unto Aaron, Thou shalt have no inheritance in the land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel. And behold, 23, 23 says, But the Levites shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance. I'm going to go to one more. Numbers 26, 62. There's other ones, but just for time's sake. And those that they, and those that were numbered of them were 20 and 3,000, all males from a month old and upward, for they were not numbered among the children of Israel because there was no inheritance given them among the children of Israel. Okay, so hold up. So in 1 Timothy 5, the widows, if they had no inheritance, right, Terry? They didn't have sons or nephews taking care of them. Then the church's responsibility was to take care of them. 
the elders that served in the house of God, they were uh, worthy of double honor. And I could do a whole Bible class on just that, but let's assume right now honor to you means money. So they were uh, worthy of double honor, but that wasn't just the preachers because again, he said, especially those that labor in the word and doctrine, that's the preachers, okay? And so the church was responsibility was to take care of the old women and the old men who were like the Old Testament Levites who had no inheritance. They didn't have any other means of income. And so it became the church's responsibility. And wouldn't that be great if our churches, every one of them, took care of the ones who can't take care of themselves? Because there was three other groups in the Old Testament that didn't have the means to take care of themselves. And so in the Old Testament, the tithes went four ways. To the Levites, because they had no inheritance. It went to the fatherless, didn't have a daddy. It went to the widows, didn't have a husband. And it went to the stranger. They're in a land, they ain't even got a job yet. So there's still strangers there, and it became Israel's responsibility to take care of them, and the church uh, should be ready to take care of folks who are in need. The whole, okay, enough said. No, it's not. Let's go to Luke chapter 10, Derek. Uh, the scripture came to mind in Luke 10, verse 7. <clears throat> I'm going to pull it up. Hold on. Now, Jesus is about to send his disciples out. Jesus is about to send his disciples out. Can you see me? Yes, sir. So you know I'm getting really serious, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. He's about to send his disciples out. And um, let's see what he says about their offerings. Let's see what he says about their source of income. And then we're going to get back to the uh, prophets or prophecy, prayerfully here in just a minute, maybe at 930. Got one more question, though. Um, and so when he sends them out, he gives them a commandment. Terry, Luke 10, verse 7, read. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire, okay. though not from house to house. Okay. So he says, uh, Luke 10, I send you as lambs among wolves. Don't take a purse. Don't take a script. Don't take shoes. Don't salute anybody. Whatever house you go, say peace to this house. If the peace, son of peace is there, your peace will rest upon him. If not, turn again. He says in, again in verse seven, the, in the same house remain. Doing what, Terry? Two things. Eating and drinking. What? Such, thing as, such things as they give. What did he say about how much money they give you? It's not a whole lot at all. Oh, it's not any, is it? Carry neither purse nor script nor shoes. They ain't got nothing to put money in. Hold on. Verse 7. Whatever house you go, remain eating and drinking such things that they have as they give. And then there's a colon after give. Yeah. For the labor of what? Is worthy of his hire. So what is the laborer's hire that's going out to minister to people? This eating and drinking that they are that the people of that house give. That's his hire. Making sure that he has a place to lay his head in food. That was the hire. The laborer is worthy of his hire. That's it. Food in a place where you don't have to sleep outside. And, yeah. then, and, and when you get in the New Testament, so don't, don't, okay. And there's another parallel scripture that speaks about the same pretty much event. Uh, Matthew 10 and 10, Terry, turn there. Nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet stays, for the workman is worthy of clean. Back up to verse number eight. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Uh, colon, freely you have received, freely what? Freely give. Yeah. Uh, so somebody putting a price on the gospel is what I was talking about last week. Um, you heal, you cleanse, raise the dead, cast out devils, and then he said, freely you received, freely give. This is commandment. 
Verse 9, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses. He said, don't even take no money with you, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor your staffs. You got to go and have Stacy Adams and be all slick. He, he says, verse number 10, colon, for the what? Workman is worthy of his meat. See, in Luke 10 and 7, meat uh, are so higher is in Matthew 10 and 10, meat. Your hire was your food if you went out and ministered, that you didn't have to starve while you were there. And that is not what God is seeing out of his people nowadays. And so no wonder God is not moving like uh, some say that he used to move. Um, I know some places where he's doing more miracles than this in the book of Acts. But there's other places they don't see the move of God. Well, maybe they ought to do it differently than what they're doing. So we've looked at three scriptures. Workman, the labor is worthy of his hire. He's worthy of his meat, is what Matthew said. Um, that was his hire. And then we looked at 1 Timothy 5 and 8. And we could keep on going down each of these and talk again about Paul and, and others. Terry, talk to me um, real quick. And I want to spend the last half hour uh, on prophecy. And there is one question um, about the preachers putting the price on the word of God and the, uh, the seed of offering. Um, and again, when you look in the scripture, um, well, man, um, maybe I'll close with this. If I don't, I'll open up with that question next week. Terry, bring us up to where we are, and then I need to move forward and talk about uh, more about the gifts of the Spirit and prophecy. Go ahead. Yeah, the scriptures are very plain here. And so uh, oftentimes, you know, we're just looking at this, the scriptures of, you know, well, this workman and the labor and the preacher is worthy of so much reward and double hire. But here we are here, you got the scripture very plainly saying, listen, when you go out, you're not supposed to be focusing on the things God is going to provide for you. It's not, I'm not, uh, this is not my part-time job to where I'm just trying to, um, this is my gig, preaching is my gig. That's not what this is. We are to, to go out and preach God's word, doing it the Bible way. God will make sure you've got a, a roof over your head. You've got something to eat. You've got something to drink. You worry about doing what God has for us to do and not the stuff, not the money. Yeah, yeah. Um, man, it's hard for me to leave where we are. Uh, where we are because I think it's so important for all of us. And, um, and again, I'm not condemning um, a person who spends 100% of their time uh, working in the gospel, receiving something. I'm not condemning them. But I know for sure God does not want there to be a price on the gospel. And God is not pleased if there is a price on the gospel. I know a man, know of a man who uh, asked to come and preach um, at, a, at, a, at a church that I used to go to for free. He used to come every year. Then he became big time and he went to a church not far from there and they raised $50,000 for him for one message. He was up about an hour. And uh, he told them keep their money. He said he had got fifty thousand dollars in years. When he preaches, he gets a hundred thousand, and so they ended up having to write him a hundred thousand dollars for a message. God's not pleased. Um, Terry, I, I want to stay. Um, um, let's go to First Timothy. We're going to stay down the street. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, we're going to stay down the street for a little while, so that when you go to God for a word, you're not blinded by money. A perverse judgment. Uh, so you're not getting into the ministry for money. And you begin to think more about what I can do so that I prefer my brother and sisters. And maybe I go and do extra work 
so that I can help feed the poor and feed the stranger. And and I sometimes, yeah, uh, I better get, I better go ahead because I get in trouble. I might lose some of my friends. Uh, First Timothy chapter six. Let's go there. The Bible speaks how the love of money is the root of all evil. We talked about that just a little bit last week. But there is a verse um, <clears throat> he speaks about in verse 5, the perverse disputings of men, a corrupt mind is destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. Mm. He said what, Terry, in verse 5, do what with these folks? From such withdraw thyself. When folks start getting up and preaching and they equate gain, worldly gain, money, houses, land, with godliness. The word of God says in 1 Timothy 6 and 5, withdraw yourself from people like that. Don't have them in your pulpit ever again who get up and profit lie and try to make somebody think that the more money, the more God. Okay? Mm. Peter said, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. Um, Paul said, I know how to be. I've learned he, not only to be uh, abound, but he said, I learned how to be abased. Uh, God worked on me and brought me down. I had all these accolades, but here I am now down. I would never want anybody to preach to me that would not do it for free. Yes. I would not ever want anybody to play in our church that would not play for free. Then I want to be a blessing to folks and God has blessed me to be a blessing. But if it's not in their heart to do it for free, I don't want to receive it from them. And the ones who would do it for free are the ones who I want to be a blessing to. Those are the ones who I want to be the millionaires, is the ones who say money ain't important. I preach for free. If God gives me a microphone, I'm doing it. God gives me it, I'm playing. I um, had a man when he learned that nobody at Turning Point is on the payroll. Not one. Terry, how much have you ever got paid for playing saxophone at Turning Point Church? Zero. Zero dollars. <laughs> And so the list goes on and on. We got some great organists. We got four. And then I play it every once in a little bit. They never gave me nothing. We got key, four keyboard organists, pianists. We've got uh, three great bass players. I play a little bit too. We've got three great horn players. And, um, and we've got uh, several great drummers. And none of them have ever got a dime we're playing at Turning Point. I told God when we started, so I'm, I'm really pouring my heart out, I think, to the pastors out there. Um, but I told God when we started, I'd rather sing a cappella than pray, play, uh, pay somebody to have to pay some, play some music because I'd rather have the presence of God in the house and the move of God rather than the move. And the move, music does make you jail. Makes it easier for you to sing and be on sing, singing wise. But I'd rather have the real move of the Spirit of God. Um, yes. And um, so anyways, First Timothy 6. I'm going to apologize because I'm not digging into the scriptures tonight. Um, yes. But they're so self-explanatory, you shouldn't have to. He says, verse 6, but godliness with what? Contentment is what? Is great. Yeah, great yeah, when I'm satisfied with yes. what God has allowed me to have, then, then, then I'm content. So it's not enticing to me, to me, for somebody to profit lie and say that uh, if you do this, God's going to pay off all your bills by Friday. That's lying. I, I haven't seen one time where that came to pass. I've heard of it a bunch of times to thousands. 
but I've never seen it come to pass. And then the people are there again the next time. We got to stop having that mess in our church. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Terry, say that. Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and is certain what? We carry nothing out. And having what? Food and raiment. Let us be there with content. So I can have godliness and with contentment, and that contentment is having food and clothes, and I'm good. I'm good. With food and clothes, I'm good. And, and, um, and so that's verse 8. But they that will be rich fall into temptation in the snare. He's, when he says they that will, he's saying when somebody has a desire to be rich. Yes. And, and uh, he said they fall into divers, uh, into temptations, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, of all evil. Um, so much more to say. Talk to me, brother. It's just this is just a good message um, tonight. I'm just going back to that verse six. But godliness with contentment is great gain, you know. And uh, you know, as with an accounting degree, we're always talking about profits, and it's like, well, we can just invest in contentment. Let's spend more time with contentment and, and godliness, um, and we don't have to go out searching out for this or that if it's for you had spoken on maybe a couple months ago, as far as the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he is our father, he's our good shepherd, and there's timings to things. And so I don't want to, I don't have to go after, if, if God is, if it's not for me to have, then I don't want it. And if it's for me to have, then I'd have it. And so whatever I have, then I'm going to just be content with that. And the Bible is telling me that's great gain, not going out and compromising, not going out and doing something outside of God's will or the motive and having the will to be rich, just being content and having the faith that God, whatever he has for me, is what I'm to have right now. I just put up Ephesians 4.28, Terry. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. Um, um, what does Paul say to the church? Read. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that need it. Okay, and so if I have everything that my house needs, that's not good enough. Why is that not good enough? Well, we don't have enough to give to somebody else. Yeah. If I only have enough to give for my own house, that's not good enough. He says, but working with the hands of the thing that is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Because again, it is our responsibility to prefer our brothers and our sisters. And it is our responsibility to take care of other folks that don't have whether it's the elders, especially those that labor in the word and doctrine, whether it is the widows, uh, especially those who don't have a son or a nephew to take care of them, especially the fatherless, especially the stranger, especially the poor. It is our responsibility as the church of the living God to be able to do that and this is what Paul was overseeing uh, with the Corinthians in their giving, in the offering that they lifted. And I spent a lot of time talking the way I teach about giving. Ezekiel 14, verse 7 through 9. So all those who want to get be a preacher so they can get rich, read Terry, verse 7. For every one of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourneth in Israel, which separateth himself from me and setteth up his idols in his heart and putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. 
Is that through nine? And I will set my face against that man and will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And if a prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. Yeah. So again, everyone, everyone at the house of Israel or a stranger, when he separates himself from God. Mm -hmm. And how does he do that? By what? By setting up his idols in his heart. Yeah, he don't have to have a physical idol. But if he has a spiritual idol that is in his heart, putteth the stumbling block of his iniquity before his faith, cometh to, uh, to a prophet to inquire of him concerning me. So check this out. Are, are you with me, Terry, so far? Yes, sir. It was just breaking up a little bit, so I was focusing there. Okay. So, if somebody set up an idol in their heart, their heart is going after stuff yes. that's not God, but they come to a prophet. Okay. Okay? Verse 7, and cometh to a prophet to inquire of him. Lord, what shall I do about this? And, and, and the person already in their heart wants stuff. Okay. They set up an idol in their heart. They come to a prophet to inquire of him concerning the Lord. But their heart is after stuff. But they go to the man of God, the prophet, to ask about, uh, uh, to inquire about God. But really, what they're interested in is stuff. And uh, they go and they inquire because they want stuff. So what does the Lord say? Verse uh, 7, I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. Set my face against that man as a sign and prophet. Again, Ezekiel 14, they come to a prophet, um, and they come to that prophet, um, and they really are asking that prophet, uh, inquiring about God in verse 7. The Lord said, I'll answer by myself. He says in verse 19, that the prophet be deceived when he's spoken a thing. The Lord, he said, has deceived him. And so again, you go and you have set up an idol in your heart, money. That's one of the biggest idols, silver and gold. And if you add up silver and gold in the gematria, it equals the Lord Jesus in Gematria, because that has become a lot of people's God. You set money up in your heart and you go to a prophet and ask them, I want a word, but your word is really about stuff. God says, if uh, they're deceived, it's because I deceived them. Okay. And, and uh, um, yeah, and I'll stretch out my hand upon him. Now, Having said that, my mind goes to the book of, well, it's in several books, but um, Matthew chapter 6. And we're going to end up closing here in just a few. Terry, read this for me. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Yeah. Where your treasure is, um, he says, uh, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth. Verse 21, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And we just read in Ezekiel that if you come to God and your heart has the wrong stuff in it, and you come to the man of God to inquire of God, what is God saying about this? And all it is is stuff. He says, where your treasure is, is where your heart will be. And so then he concludes this section in verse 33. Read, Terry. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
and all these things shall be added unto you. Yeah. Um, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and he says, all these things shall be added unto you. Look at the things, Terry. Here it is. I, I want you to see what the things are that God promises. Um, I take your thought, verse 28, for what? For raiment. Raiment. Um, verse 31, why take your thought for what shall ye eat? Or what ye shall drink? Or withal, withal, wherewithal shall ye be clothed? I'll say, do you remember some of the scriptures? Luke 10 and 7, the higher. Yeah. Matthew 10 and 10, the higher was the meat. 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 8, um, you have in your food, food and raiment, food and clothing, you should be content. And so now Jesus in his preaching is different than folks that prophet lie because he preaches to them that God will take care of your need and your need is your food, your clothing, and your shelter. Yes. That's what the promise is. So why would somebody come along when it's already written in a number of passages and prophesy a lie? That's because they're not about being a prophet. Mm. They're about making a prophet. Mm. They're not about P-R-O-P-H-E-T. They're about P-R-O-F-I-T. And they make their profit off of you. And we as the pastors and leaders of the church have to make that stop where we don't allow this stuff in our conventions, in our meetings, and in our churches. So I probably made some friends mad tonight, but it is what it is. I wouldn't be a friend if I didn't say what I'm saying. Um, so Jesus tells them, you seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else you need will be added. And uh, because that ain't the kingdom of God. That stuff is not the kingdom of God. He knows you have necessities, but those necessities, meat, drink, clothing, house, money, is not the kingdom of God. Terry, read verse 17. And then I think we go. Mm-hmm. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what the kingdom is about. It's about seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's about being right with God. Why in the world, if all that stuff is unimportant to God, and except for what you have need of, why in the world, if that is not important to God, why would that become the emphasis of the prophecies? It doesn't make logical sense. It doesn't make spiritual sense. But thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people yes. from their sins. Yes. And that is what the main prophecies should be about is you dig into that word and you show the people how to be saved, how to walk the walk, how to talk the talk, how to live right. Because remember, Nehemiah 6, prophets preach. And remember Amos 3 and 7, what he does, he gives a word about it first. And uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, it is the gift of prophecy that allows us to be receive revelations and understanding of the word of God, to be able to preach it, to be able to teach it. So why waste time talking about the stuff that's not important? Um, I'll pick back up on uh, prayerfully on gifts uh, next week. But I was talking in Connecticut. And I was talking to, uh, to TP. And I've been talking to others. Uh, when you look in the scripture, it is what really messed the children of God up. And the way, the reason why 
the uh, the yoke was upon the children of God to start with. He said, Woe well, unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and that right grievousness which they have prescribed to turn aside the needy from judgment and to take away the right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. What the scriptures talk about is the same thing we've been talking about tonight, that we were supposed to take care of those who can't take care of themselves, the widows, the elders, especially those that labored in the gospel, the widows, the fatherless, the strangers. That's what tithes in the Old Testament went for. But he says, but there was folks that robbed them and they put on decrees that God didn't put on. Now, we always get into uh, first, I mean, Isaiah 10, and we like to jump down. Yeah. Verse 27, it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yet yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. And it's talking about the yoke of the Assyrian in that chapter that was upon Israel. But again, we keep forgetting how they got the yoke on them. It was because that there were decrees that were being preached that God didn't that God didn't say. And they were writing prescriptions that God didn't write. And in the chapter before, it tells you who was doing it. Verse 15. The ancient, okay, verse 14, 15. Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, branch and rush in one day. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. And the prophet that teacheth what? Lies. He is the tail. For the leaders of this people do what? Cause them to err. And they that are led of them are? Destroy. Not only do the, the uh, uh, preachers go to hell, but they take the children of God to hell with them and they end up destroyed. That's what Jesus warned the Pharisees about. He said, when you make a proselyte, somebody follow you. He said, they become twice the child of hell is what you are. And so again, the ancient folk, which would in New Testament be referred to as the elders, and the prophets, those are the ones who are prescribing stuff God didn't prescribe and teaching stuff God didn't teach. They were allowing this to go on. And because of that, the children of God were messed up. I know that's right. I know that's right. Because this is not a game, but what God is going to do is he's going to cause the preachers to get back into the word and preach just word. And then God is already starting a revival. Uh, since the last time we talked, Karanja went to another city and I think he had 300 there or a hundred, maybe 186 at the third one. But, but God is blessing over there. Um, my brother, because of the work you're doing. Um, Amos 7 and 4. Terry, read for me real quick. We got about five minutes. Be but, but what I want the people to see, the preachers, the teachers, the prophets, is what God gave me. And I've been teaching about the last few weeks. But I mentioned it in, in uh, Connecticut. Uh, Zechariah 7, read. Then came the Lord. Then came the word of the Lord of hosts unto me, saying, "Speak unto all the people of the land and to the priests, saying, When ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even though seventy years, did ye at all fast unto me?" And that's a rhetorical question. And and when you ate, did you you eat for yourselves and you drink for yourselves? He said. Uh, uh, should ye not hear the words which the Lord cried by the former prophets? And the Lord had told them, for example, in Isaiah 58, how to do. And um, so you get in Zechariah 7, verse 9, that speaketh the Lord of hosts, execute true judgment, show mercy and compassions every man to his brother, colon, 
Oppress not the widow, fatherless, stranger, poor. Let none of you imagine evil against his brother in your heart. But they refused to hearken, poured away their shoulders, stopped their ears that they should not hear. They made their hearts like a stone. And what God goes on to tell them is because you don't take care of them and you don't didn't hear the cry of the folks in need. He said, then I'm not going to hear your cry. And he tells them this is why he scattered Israel among all the nations whom they knew not. The reason why is exactly because of what I've been talking about tonight. The folks started getting into just me and myself and getting stuff for me and myself. Stop realizing that Israel, just like nowadays, the church is not just about you. And that you are there and, the, and God gives you a word of prophecy, not to talk about them uh, and, and just focus on money, and, and, uh, but to take care of folks. And he said in um, Zechariah 7, 4 and 5, 70 years, he lets them know, I didn't hear you. I didn't receive your fasting because you didn't do it the way the prophets had said to do it. When you read Isaiah 58 now, this time you read it, you'll find out that it was all about them in Isaiah 58. <clears throat> so we usually talk about the first 10 verses. Um, but when you get down to verse 13, he said, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath of the light, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, not finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. This was the one error in their fasting. It's really only one. One major error, and that is they made their fast all about them. They didn't give to the poor. They didn't give it to the fatherless. They didn't give it to the widows, but they wanted God to bless them. They would speak their own words, do their own pleasure, do their own ways. And they thought God was going to honor. But in Zechariah 7, 4 and 5, 70 years, he didn't honor any. He didn't honor their fast as a whole. Terry talked to me and then I'm going to close out. I apologize that I didn't get on prophecy very much, but I'm thankful that what we got on is something that if you take this, um, then God is going to take your ministry to a different level because your preaching is not going to be about money and the measure of success in life is not going to be about things. Uh, you'll be like Paul and you'll consider it all as dung that I might win Christ. Terry, talk to us. Yeah, you've been talking about the gifts and the gifts were given to profit with all. It was always designed to uh, be a blessing to the body. It's not just us uh, seeking after our own, but once again, it's it's how can I be a blessing to somebody else? And so even in my sacrifice to God, what's my motive in doing so? Uh, I can have, I can give my body to be burned. I can give all my, I can give everything to the poor, but God is looking at the heart and he's looking at what was the motive behind it. Why are you doing what you're doing? Mm -hmm. God, at it. And it should be about somebody else, not just us. Yeah, yeah. So talk to me about prophecy relative so to I, that. If I'm, if I'm looking at prophecy, I'm saying what God has to say. Uh, this isn't about money. It's not about things. Um, it is to make sure that I am edifying uh, somebody. That's the whole purpose, to edify, to exhort, to comfort. Um, it shouldn't be a focus on things, not that which I say or that which I'm even trying to get. If I'm looking for a reward, then I just need to look to the hills. I need to get my reward in heaven. Mm -hmm. But even that which I'm trying to get is um, what I'm worthy of there for that honor and that reward is going to be my food, my clothes, my raiment. God is going to provide for those things. Okay. And so there was a question. It was the third question on here. And it had to do with the seed and... Um, there's another parallel question. I'm going to just take a couple minutes and then we may start there next week. 
<clears throat> but 2 Corinthians 9 and 1 Corinthians 9 both deal with giving. And um, this question, can I comment on 1 Corinthians 9, verse 7 through 10? And the answer is yes. <laughs> and so I will for just a moment. Who goeth to warfare any time at, the, at his own charges, who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof, or who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock. Say I these things, that the manner saith not the law the same also. For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn, doth God take care for oxen. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes, for our sakes no doubt. This is written, that he that plows shall plow in hope, and he that uh, threshes in hope shall be partaker of his hope. <clears throat> so, now, he uses an Old Testament example of plowing, okay? In the Old uh, Testament uh, parable of the not muzzling the ox. Uh, Terry, if, a, if an ox is plowing corn and I muzzle the ox, what does it prevent the ox from doing? Breathing. Well, they can still breathe if they muzzle. I'm not going. I'm not suffocating them. There's room to breathe, but it keeps his mouth from opening. Can't communicate. We can't communicate. But the 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 message here is he can't look at verse seven. Who goeth to warfare any time his own charges planteth a vineyard and what? Eateth not. Uh huh. Our food is, feedeth the flock and what? Eateth not of the milk of the flock. Yeah, eateth not of the vineyard, or eateth not his milk. We call it drinking. They call it here eating. There's another passage where it talks about the exact same thing relative to your food and water. Okay? And so when he's saying don't, about not muzzling the ox that treadeth out the corn, as that ox is pulling the plow, and there's corn in the field, while he's pulling, he can eat. Yeah. Okay, don't no stop it from verse 7, eating. And that follows with what we've talked about the whole night. Luke 10, verse 7, Matthew 10 and 10, 1 Timothy 6, verse 8. All of them talking about when you have somebody that um, an elder, a widow, a uh, minister in the church, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine, uh, certainly, they should be able to have food in uh, in in our raiment, food and clothing. That's what he's talking about here. Now, Paul again does it a little different because he even worked that he wouldn't be a burden to the people some of the time. So, if you keep on reading in the verse seventeen, Terry read. Seventeen says, "For if I do this thing willingly." I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. I do the same will, I have a reward, but against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Verse 18, what? What is my reward then? Mm -hmm. Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Go ready, verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Read. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, and that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Mm -hmm. To them that are without ho law. Ho hold on, hold on, because our time is running out. But Paul goes on and talks about, again, not muzzling the ox that treadeth out the corn. Uh, that they can eat of what they're doing. But then he goes on to say um, his reward, his reward is the ones that he gains. Um, the Jews and the Gentiles. Um, yeah. Read that again. Chapter 9, you'll see it differently. Uh, read 2 Corinthians chapter 9, you'll see it differently. You'll see it right. Um, and so, yeah, I believe that if that's all somebody does, 
then they should have their necessities met if they don't have another means. But what I don't want any of the children of God to do is put a price on the Word of God. Because when you begin to do that, you are wrong. God will bless us if we do the Bible thing the Bible way. Father, we come in Jesus' name. We say thank you for the things that you have done. I pray God, even as you use us in the gifts of the Spirit,